guys, so today's video is going to focus on DNA, whether that be the structure, comparing prokaryotes to eukaryotes DNA, as well as the cell cycle and mitosis and meiosis, and even some DNA replication. First off, we're just going to talk about the structure of DNA. So we know DNA is made up of a deoxyribose sugar, phosphate, and a nitrogenous base. And for that deoxyribose sugar, you're going to have a hydrogen on one end and a phosphate group on the other end. And so with DNA, it runs 5' prime to 3' prime on one strand and then 3' prime to 5' prime on the other strand. Um, we just call that anti-parallel. So on your deoxyribose, the hydrogen group is going to be on your 3' prime end. And then the phosphate group will be on your 5' prime end. And how I remember this, I just remember... Hydrogen has a lower atomic mass, so it'll go with the lower number. It'll go with the three. And then just remember the phosphate group goes with the other, the opposite. And then again, we have our phosphate or nitrogenous base. And so here in this picture, you can see our nucleotides. In between these complementary base pairs, you're going to have hydrogen bonds. Um, and also, as we can see, we see some of Chargaff's rules just saying that C bonds with G and A bonds with T. And so that's going to be our purines and our pyrimidines. So your purines are going to be adenosine and guanine, and then your pyrimidines are going to be cytosine and thymine. And with science, you're going to be memorizing a crap ton of stuff. So I say for stuff like this, just memorize one and then know the other is going to be the opposite or whatever is left. So for your purines, I just think ag, adenosine and guanine. And then pyrimidines is just going to be what's ever left, that cytosine and that thymine. And so again, you're going to have hydrogen bonds between these base pairs. And another thing to note is here between C and G, there's three of those dashed lines which are depicting the hydrogen bonds. So cytosine and guanine are going to have three hydrogen bonds and be stronger, while your A and T are only gonna have two hydrogen bonds. And then for our backbone, we're gonna have covalent bonds. And then you're gonna have phosphodiester bonds in the backbone just holding the DNA together too. So there's a lot of DNA in an organism, especially in eukaryotes, which are multicellular. So an organism is going to have to have a way to compact that DNA. So first we have our nucleosome, and just which that DNA wraps around eight histone proteins. And then that's going to further compact into chromatin, which we see down here is just a bunch of those nucleosomes further compacted. This happens in, you'll see this in interphase. And then we also have a solenoid, which is when the DNA is coiled, and it's coiled by scaffold proteins. This happens before mitosis, and then it'll eventually make this kind of structure of rosettes. Also, the structure of parts of the chromosomes. So first off, we have the centromeres, which are just located here. They hold the sister chromatids together, and they're just repeated sequences of DNA. And then associated with these centromeres, we have these proteins called kinetochores, which just serve as microtubule attachment sites. So those kinetochores will be here with the centromeres, and then these microtubules will go and attach on them. And then the last part is telomeres, which are just repeated sequences of DNA on the ends of the chromosomes. So they'll be here and here and here. So as you age, your chromosomes actually shorten and so that's why we have the telomeres there to protect your chromosomes because since they're repeated sequences of DNA it's not as important if those shorten and get lost as opposed to if they were unique parts of your DNA. Now to compare and contrast prokaryotes and eukaryotes in regards to their DNA and the chromosomes. So first of all, for prokaryotes or, or unicellular organisms, they have a genophore, which is a singular circular chromosome, and they don't have any membrane-bound organelles, 
They don't go through mitosis or meiosis. They actually use a form of asexual production through binary fission. And then our eukaryotes, on the other hand, have linear chromosomes. They do have the membrane to bound organelles, and they undergo mitosis and meiosis. Now, both of them do involve duplication and segregation of the DNA. So even though prokaryotes don't have the mitosis and meiosis, they still do have that um, duplication and segregation of their DNA. The only thing is in prokaryotes that is coupled. Now talking a little bit more about prokaryotes and their asexual binary fission process. So this is an active process, so it does require ATP. And so it's going to start at the origin of replication, and it's going to move bidirectionally, so in both directions, until it reaches the terminus. And then it'll start forming a septum in the middle until it eventually pinches off and separates into two identical cells. So to make that septum, you're going to have the FTSC protein, and that just codes and tells the cell to form that septum and eventually that septum will pinch off and become two different cells. Now getting into the cell cycle, there's a lot of important proteins involved in this process. So first we have cyclins, which are just proteins um, for the cell cycle. So they're going to increase with the start of mitosis and decrease with the end of mitosis. So basically these are just regulatory proteins produced cyclically in a cycle just to initiate and end that mitotic process. And then we have kinases. And just a tip, anytime you see ACE, just know that's an enzyme. So kinases are enzymes that activate other molecules via phosphorylation. And then we have CDKs, which are called cyclin-dependent kinases. So it's exactly what it sounds like, cyclins that couple with kinases to phosphorylate other molecules. And so these just determine which stage of mitosis you are entering. So here's a picture on the right. The first one is just showing how, you know, we talked about with cyclins, it increases with the start of mitosis and decreases towards the end. And then how also your kinases and everything in your CDKs are also involved with that. So that just shows in the different phases of the cell cycle where those different protein levels are at. And then down below that, we see our CDK and our cyclin. So whenever that cyclin and that CDK bind together, that will cause a conformational change and an active site for the CDK will open up so that the molecule that it needs to activate can bind and then phosphorylate it and activate it for whatever process it needs to follow out. Now for the actual steps of the cell cycle. So first we have G1, which just prepares for duplication. And we do have a checkpoint after G1. It just checks that there's enough materials and enough surface area and space and volume and everything to duplicate that DNA. And then in the S, the synthesis phase, that's where the duplication of your DNA is going to take place. Then we move on to G2, which just prepares for segregation and mitosis. So in the G2 checkpoint, it just checks that the DNA is properly duplicated, no errors with that, and that proteins are prepared to prepare for mitosis. And then mitosis is just that segregation of the cytoplasm and DNA. And there is a checkpoint in anaphase that just checks that the microtubule attachment is correct. So for mitosis, we just know that this creates identical cells, so that means you're going to start with a diploid cell and end with a diploid. They're going to be identical. And this is for somatic cells or body cells. So first we have that interphase in which we have those two chromosomes. And then in prophase, that nuclear membrane breaks down and you have your spindles. And that DNA is duplicated. So then we get these two chromosomes like this. And then metaphase, just think meta, middle. Those homologous chromosomes are going to line up in the center on the equatorial plate. And then anaphase is when those microtubules are going to attach and pull the sister chromatids apart. 
and move them to opposite pole sides of the cell. And then telophase is when, you know, you get that septum and that cell is slowly starting to pinch off with those spindles. And then obviously cytokinesis is when it actually breaks apart and you are left with two identical cells that are diploid, just like what we started with. And meiosis is going to create genetically diverse cells and you're going to start with diploid and move to haploid by the end of it. So when I think of meiosis, I just think meiosis is what makes me and you. So, you know, it's going to be like genetically, it's going to have to do with gametic cells or those sex cells. Um, and so the first part, interphase, it starts the same with that diploid cell with the two chromosomes. And then in prophase, again, that DNA is going to duplicate. And you're going to have those two chromosomes looking like that. And actually, um, they can form tetrads in just which they line up those two chromosomes with one another. And they can do crossing over, which basically just creates a new combination of like DNA and chromosomes just because parts of them will switch. So that will cause recombinant DNA and is what accounts for that genetically diverse cell. And then metaphase, again, they just line up in the middle at the equatorial plate. Anaphase one is when, again, um, the homologous chromosomes will separate and move to opposite sides of the cell. And then telophase one and cytokinesis, again, just that septum's formed and the slow pinching off until they eventually become two different cells. And as you can see, you can see the difference between prophase because what we had at the beginning and now in prophase two. So for metaphase, Again, just line up at the middle at the equatorial plate. Once you get to prophase two, it's basically just like mitosis. So then metaphase two, yeah, like we just said, line up at the equatorial plate. In a phase two, the sister chromatids are pulled apart and moved to opposite sides. And then until phase two and cytokinesis, again, just that pinching inward. And you'll eventually end up with four different unique cells. Um, so again, just Remember, the prophase 1 is a little bit different just because the homologous chromosomes separate in anaphase 1, and then anaphase 2 has to do with the sister chromatids. Once you get to all the phase 2 things, it's basically just like mitosis. For DNA replication, this has three phases to it, initiation, elongation, and termination. And these steps are what they sound like. So first we're gonna have our helicase, which again, we see that ACE, so we know it's an enzyme. There's lots of enzymes involved in the process of DNA replication. So that helicase is gonna unzip the DNA strand. And then we have this enzyme called primase, which is gonna add an RNA primer to our strand of DNA, to one of the complementary strands. Um, and it's gonna grow from five prime to three prime anytime you're adding nucleotides to it, it's gonna go from five prime to three prime. So just remember that. And then, so when we say RNA primer, that's just gonna be complementary RNA strands on that DNA. And why we need primase is because DNA polymerase, which later adds the complementary base pairs to the DNA strand, it has to have a template or like, it has to have other nucleotides to add on to. It can't just add on to nothing. So we have to start with that RNA primer with those RNA uh, base pairs. And then our DNA polymerase will come in later, add the complementary base pairs to that existing primer. And then eventually at the end, that DNA, DNA polymerase will change those RNA base pairs to DNA base pairs. And it also has proofreading abilities just because with DNA, obviously you do not want any mistakes because that's how mutations happen and can cause issues. So then that happens, and then at the end, you just have your ligase, another enzyme, which just binds the DNA strands together.